World Series champion has been crowned. After decades of misery, the Rangers have finally snapped an incredibly mediocre legacy of failure. Despite many coming up short in their quest, there are plenty of teams that have been on vacation for quite some time now, each with a different story to tell, and each with different ambitions. The only thing bonding them is failure. How much of it depends on the franchise? This is one of the few teams that truly turned out what I had expected them to, an incredibly mediocre franchise. They would show flashes of incredible fire, but were way too inconsistent to take seriously in any form. Every Masataka Yoshida revelation undone by a season-ending injury to Jaren Duran. Every shocking return to health for Chris Sale undone by Corey Kluber falling apart in himself. Every white-hot July undone by a disastrous September that knocks them out of contention entirely. Even if the orders have been mixed from ownership, frustration is mounting. And the cost is Heimblum's job. He did good work building up the farm system, but his moves at the Major League level were... weird. Some of that was forced by FSG, yes, but what does it have to do with his inaction at the trade deadline? Dave Bush was also told to take his pitching expertise elsewhere, yet Boston knows this is a crucial offseason for their immediate future. A lot of decisions have to be made about the direction of the club. And there will be a new czar to join forces with Alex Cora, former Red Sox champion Craig Breslow, a pitching guru praised for his intelligence and foresight. His impact will have to be immediate. They'll want to get back to upending their rivals as soon as possible. There were two different arcs of Yankee baseball this season. One was with Aaron Judge. The man was bailing out a litany of self-inflicted problems with his bat and glove. The other was one cruel fate took him away with injury. Without the anchor of their lineup, pinstripes were laid bare for all to see. The Bronx is absolutely useless without Judge or Garrett Cole carrying that. Throughout Yankee Stadium, there are injured bodies and piles of burned money littering the field of play. Giancarlo struggling to hit off-speed pitches. Anthony Rizzo playing with an undiagnosed concussion for months. The bringer of reigning pays languishing for months before being cut. And then the pitching. Less said about how wrecked the starting rotation was the better. Montas never took the mound. Radon was a massive flop. Severino chose to become a meatball chef and Herman went from a perfect game to a perfect embarrassment. It all adds up to a lost season. One that should cause the Yankees to look hard at how stale things have gotten but they'll chalk it up to Judge's injury and continue as if nothing's wrong. Aaron Boone and Brian Cashman will remain, despite the cries of their fans for their ouster. Al sees nothing wrong with them. They got over 500 again! They need to focus on the important stuff, like bunting. The future is grand. Besides, they have Anthony Volpe, the golden goose of the franchise. Not to mention the Martian. Before he was probed under the knife at Roswell. What the hell didn't happen? Apparently anything resembling competence. A disastrous 2022 gave way to a year that was somehow even worse than that in every conceivable fashion. Even with every single mistake they've made and how cheap they are, there's no reason this team should be this bad. Everyone and their mother was underperforming. Not even sluggish, but so poorly disciplined and unorganized you wonder if they even practiced. How the hell do you get rid of Tony La Russa and things somehow get worse? This organization isn't worth a damn. Rick Hahn and Ken Williams were fired? Great, maybe we can talk to Rick at the parade celebrating it. Most bad teams simply promote from within out of the fear of new incompetent ideas. Guess what the White Sox did? Assistant GM Chris Getz got promoted, you'll be hearing a rant in 2038. Pedro Griefall has run an incredibly leaky ship, but he can stay too because he isn't falling asleep in the dugout. Only guys in the bullpen are. The rebuild has been a total failure, and blowing up the team seven years ago has resulted in probably blowing up the team. Tim Anderson and the team announcer are just the start of the purge. What else is there to look forward to here? Jerry potentially selling the team and expansion to his cigar bar, or God forbid, relocation. I feel for White Sox fans. Team's future looks as depressing as guaranteed rate field is. It's obvious to anyone that pays attention to Cleveland that the entire franchise is cursed. No matter what they attempt or how they try to overcome every obstacle, they'll somehow be unable to deal with the crushing weight of fate itself. The bats have always been sluggish for the Guardians recently. They couldn't find a chorus alongside Josh Naylor and Jose Ramirez. And big pieces were brought in for that. Bell and Zanino just flopped miserably. And the homegrown hitters were hit or miss. However, this year, their usually reliable pitching fell to cruel mistresses. Karen checked Quantro and Plesak to regression, McKenzie to a nagging injury, and Bieber to both an arm ailment and a probable offseason trade. Some potency, but lacking enough power to truly overcome every flaw. The Cleveland way. I'll give them credit for trying to load up on a bunch of former Angels pitchers to compete with the Twins, but they scampered off on them in about a week. 
As I said, nothing they do works out. The final cost will be in the departure of Tito. Health ailments have weakened him. And he's stepping down as manager to be with family. It was great in the past, but it felt like time for a shakeup. If only to see if something else will work for the Guardians. Trying to poach Craig Council didn't, but perhaps Stephen Vogt could. They just need anything at this point. At least we can say it went better than last year. Although, let's be real, that's not saying much of anything. The Tigers are still a mediocre team, but they showed signs of progress compared to that. There were just too many flaws to be reliable. The pitching staff was too injured to gain form. The hitting core went through way too many rough patches and were pretty bad as a whole. It leads to a subpar team that could only feast on its weak division. Detroit did finish second in the AL Comedy Central. I'm as surprised as you are. There are good moments, though. Riley Green and Spencer Torkelson are starting to show form and hitting the baseball with authority. Starting pitching and bullpen both have great features and show promise. And this was the final send-off to a legend in Miguel Cabrera. It's a bittersweet moment. The final tie to the Mr. I days has been seven. He was far past Cook, but the Pujols' comeback last year is usually an outlier. The dark chapter of Tigers baseball will hopefully move on as well. If they not whiff on their moves like Javi Baez does at the plate. The season was doomed from the get-go. Consider it like most of their pitchers on the map. Forced to make an appearance as they get repeatedly whacked by opposing hitters. A conga line of runners dancing from base to base without resistance. There was only one arm with a damn for them this year. Cole Reagans. That's it, just Cole Reagans. Everyone else was either injured, regressed, or got traded away. Hitting was the same predicament. It was long over the moment Vinny Pasquantino suffered a season ender. That was just the miserable icing on the cake. Bobby Wood Jr. improved at least. It's all you can rely on when cleaning up after Dayton Moore. I don't think we realized things were this bad with them until last season. Now it's an even longer road ahead than before. Zach Greinke really had to go out like this. He deserves so much better. All I can reason for the Angels' misfortunes is that the baseball gods are pissed at Artie Moreno for not selling the team. There is no other logical explanation as to why a critical season turned into a complete disaster in nearly every metric imaginable. The major culprit? No luck. Anyone you could shake a stick at suffered at minimum a four-week injury. The most injured franchise in baseball. And it was usually in incredibly freak circumstances. Anthony Rendon has turned into another Moreno disaster class who missed a huge chunk of the season due to a bruise. Did the Angels fuck that up too? Mike Trout suffered a handmade bone injury that was all but the beginning of the end. He tried to come back but turned into Highlander where there could only be one game he played. The less said about Shohei, the better. The AL MVP had a season for the ages but faded with a whimper as he went under the knife. That would be simple enough, but the real mess happened at the deadline. Despite all the injuries, a paper soft schedule had them near playoff contending status. Cue a big brain moment. The Angels had to go all in. They splurged on some of the best names available with whatever they could spare from their meager farm system. It self-destructed within a week. Turns out Artie really is definitely afraid of the luxury tax. They threw most of their acquisitions on waivers a month later. I don't exaggerate when I say this season could have set the Angels back years. Shohei is all but gone. Trout may be gone if he wants to leave. Phil Nevin was somehow still here, so he's gone. Ron Washington, good luck. Your savvy with player relations may not be enough to overcome Artie's hellscape. He's done nothing but fuck up everything left and right. And this season might just be his magnum opus. Take a bow, sir. You've earned it. The team of despair has morphed into one of bitter hatred. The shittiness of the A's on the field was never the concern. Blatantly throwing everything into the wind for what appears to be very minimal return on investment will usually result in a non-major league caliber franchise. The true hope was in the fading dreams of Howard Terminal. It turned out to be a ruse. John Fisher was merely using them as a conduit to get a deal done in Las Vegas. Oakland will be uprooted. All that remains is the approval of the other owners to confirm the move. And the city will be betrayed for the final time. The official end of the Moneyball era, ironically, is all about money. Public funding, to be frank. If Fisher really wanted to stay in Oakland, he would have found a way to do it. Why not just build on the land around Oco? That's right, because less public money. The lease in Oakland expires next season, and it'll be a bleak hell that no one will want to be around for. Just shades of Noda, Rooker, and Geloff. All I'm gonna say, like you guys trying to build a major league stadium on nine fucking acres? Good luck with that. Being a Mariners fan is like having a fetish for sadism. You like nothing but punishment. Last year felt like the beginning of something new, now. The first half of the year was a massive disappointment, but did you see that white-hot August they had? Julio turning into a complete dynamo? 
Rallying to stake a claim for a division that no one wanted to claim? I hate to inform you that last season wasn't a changing of the guard. It was a pause in program. They now return to punching you in the dick. Your September returns to incredibly sluggish. Worse, it ends in the most brutal way possible. At the hands of Houston and Texas. They bested your starting pitching, the ultimate strength. Eliminated by a game and cursed by bad luck aplenty. If they were in the NL, they make it easily. Frustrations abound, and fingers can be pointed left and right, mainly at the slow start and awful chew. But the Mariners, like Jerry DePoto, are keener on winning 54% instead of pushing for a World Series. The Pirates try pulling the shit in the mid-2010s. I have experience in this thing. Let me tell you how this goes, Seattle. It works until it doesn't. And when it doesn't, things go to shit quickly. And when that happens, the next regime usually drops a nuke. I hope you don't suffer the same fate they did. J-Rod is too talented to suffer through that. Why did Seattle sell at the deadline anyway? What does a $330 million payroll get to these days? A devastating season-ending injury to Edwin Diaz before a pitch is thrown. Welcome back to Mets Baseball, where you thought you could escape from your past, yet it merely mutates into a different strain. One where everything falls apart in the worst possible ways. Drama in the locker room. Underperforming parts in the lineup and bullpen. Starling Marte and Dan Vogelbach whipping with the bases loaded. One of the greatest traditions of Lowell Mets isn't in the product. It's in the terrible Junes and common gloom. A season as painful as 1992, but it only goes out with a dud. The writing was on the wall. The greatest spending in baseball's history is immediately dismantled at the deadline. Potentially eating almost $90 million to get better prospects for the 2025 push. Did you see Scherzer and Jacob deGrom win a World Series? They may not have done much for Texas, but unlike the Mets, they had a real reasons to go on the IL. The organizational carousel goes round and round. Out go Buck Showalter and Billy Epler. In comes David Stearns to try and fix this mess. We couldn't get Craig Council on a two-for-one deal, so we had to go to the Bronx to flirt with the Mendoza line. We're also flirting with the Mets. And you expect Lemons think of them in return for Peter Alonso this offseason? The age of a rebuild is one full of twists and turns. On the field, the Nationals seem to be turning a corner in some ways. They are promising pieces in both pitchers and position players. Thank you, San Diego, for Abrams and Gore. Not to mention, Lane Thomas has been pretty solid for them so far. In others, it's the typical woes of a lost franchise. That strong August was equaled by a brutal September. Team pitching minus a few pieces? Abhorrent. A group with an ERA over five with much higher FIPS than that is a bad sign. And they'll be getting no help from Steven Strasburg. His body is broken down to the point where he's chosen to retire from the game itself. Or not. The team doesn't want to pay him what he's owed, so we'll see you in spring training, Steven. I don't care if they're improving, the Lerner family can't sell this team fast enough. Ah, oh, Cubbies, you're dubbed as the lovable losers, yet you at least live up to the latter. This year was an amalgamation of agony. The opening of the season, mediocrity and misery. Hovering around 500 with questions about what they'll do with the deadline. Dismantle? Absolutely not. Cody Bellinger will go back to MVP form. Seiya Suzuki will go from the brink of benching to a beacon of hope. Justin Steele put together a borderline Cy Young campaign. And the Northsiders were on the brink of seizing their division. All but a given they'll make the playoffs with a chance to steal more... And you collapse. Great. Only seven wins all of September, and three of them against teams not named Colorado. Can you win more than one game against Arizona down the stretch? If you do that, the entire dynamic of the National League changes. But no, everything just had to implode at the worst possible time. Confidence destroyed, season lost. Was that David? The Pirates aren't a good team? Well, maybe if you had beaten them more, perhaps you wouldn't have been fired. The Cubs are desperate to get back. Throwing everything to poach Craig Council from an hour north is testament to it. Regardless of if they get Bellinger or Stroman back, this is going to be an off-season of huge spending. I bet one of my nuts on it. I'm in two different stages of thought. The first is that the Reds just aren't ready for a real push just yet. Look at how their starting rotation was all but some cardboard and string ties for most of the year, yet we're still winning. It's a testament to their young bats carrying the day. Until they couldn't. Once the hitters went ice cold, Cincy merely rang a death rattle. Remember when Ellie Delacruz was fun to watch? It was awesome for a few weeks, wasn't he? 
The Reds simulated him at the plate in September, trying to bring in veteran bats off waivers, but Renfro and Master Bader didn't work out at all. As that and the starting pitching finally broke off, the bullpen suddenly ran out of gas. Oh, they were good for so long, and then the weight crushed them with haste. Usually with blow 9 0 leads. It's a damn shame, and blame can be made on the organization for being too passive at the deadline, but once again, they weren't ready. I think they could be something with the right moves in the offseason. But I only trust the Castellinis as far as I can throw them. Which isn't much at all. It clouds an unofficial end of an era for the Reds. Joey Votto may have played his last game in Cincinnati. True legend of the team and potential Hall of Famer ends his season and possibly career in a cruel manner. Being ejected in the first inning of game 162. What he's had to go through on this team, just let him run his mouth. I don't blame you if you forgot this, but there was a time when the Pirates were 20 and 8 to start the year. I know, crazy time to be alive. It was a paper soft schedule to begin, but it felt like something was different. We were fools. We know baseball won't allow the Pirates to have nice things. They instantly fall to shit with a nightmare May and June, and all hope is lost. Back to the doldrums with this team. Just like O'Neill Cruz not knowing how to run the bases, or the starting rotation instantly regressing back to an unwatchable form. The thing is, the Pirates have intriguing upside in the future. The batting core has a lot of solid pieces. Key Brian Hayes was raking to end the year, same as Jared Triolo. Brian Reynolds is locked up long term, even Kutch could come back. You can't let him go being that close to a milestone. Only if Derek Shelton didn't rip Jared Bednar's arm off, I believe it. Paul Skane's prepared to have the world on your shoulders next season. This team's gonna need it badly. Welcome to the Dunning-Kruger Organization, a group that fancies themselves being above most others, yet continually overlooks systemic issues on the franchise for years at a time. I'd argue this year should have been the wake-up call St. Louis desperately needed, but we all know that isn't happening. The Cardinals don't care for evolving. They want yes-men. They want Ole Marmol to continually manage the team into a bottomless pit. They want a starting rotation to outright implode on itself. No, it's not due to bringing in a bunch of soft tossers that get teed off if they're not precise. They can just blame Wilson Contreras for it all. Yep, totally his fault that Adam Wainwright should have retired this past season. He got his 200th win all at the cost of an entire season of him being cooked. But is Wilson Contreras solely at fault for the team stranding the most runners on base in the league? For that god-awful June and August? For a hitting core that was hot and cold? For the Cardinals brass, he probably is. Despite the first sub-500 season in about an age, nothing will change. This organization refuses to look itself in the mirror. They'll just trot out Goldie and Arenado next year, pray that things fall into place, and repeat the same shit in 2024. Do you expect anything different out of them? As a man who had to experience this bullshit with the Pirates in the mid-2000s, here's a handy translator. When they say they're gonna be competitive for play 500 ball, they're really on pace for around 95 losses. To be fair, they were closer to their goals than expected. You ignore their god-awful road record. Is there anyone outside of the organization that believes they can make noise in any form besides Nolan Jones? Word of advice, a team ERA over five and a half does not a competent group make. Why should I get angry over this? This is what they've embraced and we should accept their irrelevance as long. But they've got plans to lure your ass to the ballpark. Oh boy, Colorado, are you ready for a two-year deal for Herman Marquez fresh off Tommy John? What about $13 million for a fading Charlie Blackman? This is not a serious franchise. Wake me when the Monforts sell. <laughs> Decades in the future, when we're all old and gray, arguing about baseball teams of the past, there will be one major question that pops up in the commons room of the retirement home. How the hell did the 2023 Padres miss the postseason? A team that had such a positive run differential on the year, with one of the best pitching cores in baseball, a Cy Young winner as the race, and multiple award-winning hitters shouldn't have been the most humiliating elimination in ages. That is, until you look at them in high leverage spots. I have never seen a team that is just so anti-clutch, so against anything resembling situational hitting that it's a sight to behold. All that talent for minimal bounty. 2-12 in extra innings. 9-23 in one run games. They didn't get their first extra innings win until the last week of the fucking season. They go 500 in either, they cruise to October. Even worse, there's no legitimate excuse for it. Endless struggling to 10 games under 500 in the middle of September. The Friars would make a mad dash at the end against Papersoft opponents, but by that point it was too late. You don't deserve to make it if you can't beat Pittsburgh. Such failure can only be amplified by cold reality. This was their best shot and they fucked it. There are a deal lapsed. They can't compete with the big boys anymore. 
San Diego needs to shed significant payroll. In one fell swoop, all of Hater, Snell, and Soto will most likely be gone. And the dominoes keep falling. The Padres chose to let Bob Melvin continue his California tour of death to go to San Francisco. Yet are going to continue to let AJ Preller trade the farm system away for black hole rentals. San Diego, you never wanted it, but you have your baseball equivalent of the 2011 Chargers. As Arizona represents the NL in the World Series, a guttural sound rumbles in the emptiness of every fan of the franchise. They know deep down in their heart, that should have been them. And it somehow gets worse. Their owner, Peter Seidler, has passed the pearly gates. It might be the most devastating blow of them all. The man did everything he could to make San Diego a winner. And his death makes baseball worse as a result. The chance to win it all might have gone with him. From the heights of euphoria to absolute despair, the unknown approaches. This team just can't get a break. The longer time passes, the more the 2021 season for the Giants was a perfect storm of flukiness. That was a fun team to watch, but there were way too many elements that couldn't sustain themselves. Too many career seasons all at once for aging players. It just felt like a decline was inevitable, and this year almost defied it. With that starting pitching and a replacement for Buster Posey, they were in good shape to make it back to October Bowl in late August. But then Arson Judge burned everything to the ground. Hitters that couldn't hit for a damn. A bullpen that suddenly sprung a thousand leaks. Collapse City. Population U. I don't know, guys. Is a 9-19 record in September a good thing? Five wins if we're not counting Colorado? A completely open ticket to redemption repeatedly swatted oh, away no. by the team itself. Change must be made. Gabe Kapler was always a massive downgrade over Bochy, but you'd think he'd change after what happened in 2021. That answer turned out to be no. He's moved on to a career in managerial cosplay. Welcome an instant upgrade in Bob Melvin, currently seeking refugee status from the hell that is the Padres. The trade-off is the probable end of Brendan Crawford's time here. The final piece of the dynasty days out the door. Considering this franchise, it might be a while before they get back to the promised land. Oh.